What comes after terabytes? Hi everyone, Leo Notenboom here for AskLeo.com where the only thing unchanging about technology is the constant change. Terminology being one of them. Let's uh, have a look at this question. I feel like I've just crawled out from under a rock or something. Apparently Seagate has come out with new drives with zettabytes of storage. There are terabytes, which I know. This is how I store stuff. But now there are petabytes and zettabytes. In communications with someone at Seagate, they are telling me that the CIA has a computer with petaflops of processing power. I know what gigahertz is, but what is a petaflop? Or more importantly, how many gigahertz is a petaflop? Can you even buy this stuff? Or is this reserved for large companies? If you could clear some of this up, I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah terminology, especially around uh, numbers of bytes and speed of computing. It can get pretty confusing pretty quick. As I said, it's changing often. And there are some apples and oranges things going on here as well. Let's start with bytes, <laughs> bytes and more bytes. The size that we're talking about here, the various zettabytes, petabytes and so on, that you mentioned in the question, what we're talking about literally is just counting the number of bytes. A byte is eight bits. It can have a value between zero and 255. Um, it is best thought of as a character. By that, I mean a letter of the alphabet or a number. So for example, a word like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, which is uh, an homage to the Mary Poppins fans out there, would take 36 bytes to store because it's 36 characters long. Another measure that I've used in the past is the Project Gutenberg plain text version of the Bible is 5,218,805 bytes long, something we will often refer to as a megabyte, which is our first term here. We often talk about kilobytes, which are 1,024 bytes, a megabyte is 1,048,576 bytes. But before we go too much further down that path, we need to clarify some of the terms we're using and exactly what they mean and how we use them. So here's a table of the terms that we're talking about. In the first column, there's the number of bytes we're talking about, say 1,024 for a kilobyte or KB. Its magnitude, I call this an order of magnitude because it's the way we think of things, is about 1,000. Uh, and in fact, it is 1,024 to the first power. In other words, just 1,024. The power thing will become important here in a minute. The controversy or the confusion is that in fact, a kilobyte technically doesn't mean 1,024. Technically, it means 1,000 which is one of the reasons things like disk space, for example, can be represented as one thing when it's actually another. Uh, when I say kilobyte, am I meaning 1,024 or am I meaning 1,000? Depends on the context. The correct name is a kibibyte with a B instead of an L. That's 1,024, no confusion. But, and I won't go down the rest of that column, but if you need to be very specific um, and with no chance for misunderstanding, then kibibyte is what you want to mean 1,024. Like I said, in reality, in practice, the kilobyte is what we tend to use in the computing context to mean 1,024. And from a conceptual point of view, you and I tend to think of it as about 1,000. About gets a little bit more inaccurate the further we go along here. So we've talked about a megabyte, 1,048,576 bytes. Its magnitude is a million, and it's 1,024 bytes squared. So it's 1,024 times 1,024, or 1,024 to the second power. A gigabyte, roughly a billion bytes, is 1,024 to the third power. A terabyte, which is a trillion bytes, and that's probably the largest one you're seeing on hard drives right now. And it's 1,024 to the fourth power. Now, the terms that are on the horizon, the terms that you were asking about, 
these are the terms we're going to start slowly seeing more and more of as disk capacities continue to increase over time. The petabyte is a quadrillion bytes. The exabyte is a quintillion bytes. A zettabyte, a sextillion bytes. And a yottabyte, a septillion bytes. Or 1024 to the eighth power. So you can see in this table exactly what those numbers mean. The left-hand column will show you literally what these numbers mean in terms of decimal numbers that you and I might read. You notice I stopped trying to read them because they are just too long. But these are the terms that are coming after terabyte. These are what they mean. And conceptually, this is the order of magnitude you should be concerned with when you're actually just sort of thinking about how big these things are. So as I record this, the largest drive I can find online for personal use, in other words, something that I could buy for my own computer here, is around 18 terabytes. That's not uncommon. I kind of sort of expect things to get bigger over time. And to be clear, that is a traditional spinning hard disk magnetic media type of disk. The largest SSD right now, I'm told, is around eight terabytes. Uh, it's also fairly expensive. More commonly, uh, for example, the ones I've got installed in my machine are like a couple of terabytes. That's about where the price starts to make sense for an individual machine such as this. Uh, if you do have lots of cash, and I mean lots and lots and lots of cash, yeah, there's supposedly a 100 terabyte SSD out there. Um, I have no idea why you would want it right now. Um, eventually, we'll probably all have machines with them, but they won't be $40,000 a piece when the time comes. That there are larger drives in development is kind of a given, right? The, the technology folks, the scientists behind all this hardware, they're always working on packing more bits into a smaller space. And that's kind of sort of where this is headed. The question, of course, is, as always, is how fast will that happen? Don't know. You could talk about Moore's law. You could talk about some of the other laws related to capacity. The bottom line about the only assumption we can really make is that our current size disks will get cheaper and larger disks will become more common. And that's just sort of a constant thread of change throughout this industry since its inception. That's pretty much disk space. I do want to say, since you mentioned it specifically, um, I'm not seeing zettabytes anytime soon um, and probably not in my lifetime. That's a lot of bytes. I will also say that a lot of the storage you hear about at large data centers, facilities and so forth, even if they are connected to one computer, one PC, one server, they're generally not one disk. More often than not, they are arrays, sometimes arrays of many, many, many different disks or many, many different um, um, instances of the same disk. So for example, you might find uh, a data center server with 180 terabytes, but what they will have is uh, 10 18 terabyte drives. That's typically the most cost-effective way to get that kind of storage and there's also some redundancy, um, um, error recovery and resiliency built into designing that way instead of putting all of your bytes on a single disk. That's disk space. Now we have to talk about flops and hertz. This is about speed. Uh, flops and hertz are, in fact, two different ways to measure speed. They are, I'll just say, loosely related. There is not a conversion from one to the other. And we'll see why that is in a minute. Hertz is the speed at which the processor runs based on a signal that is given to the processor. It's kind of like how quickly you might turn the crank to make an engine go. You can turn it fast or you can turn it slow depending on what kind of an engine it is, what its ability to handle that speed is. But the idea is, that um, you know, a one gigahertz processor, it is performing one billion simple operations per second. Now, a billion operations per second is a lot, but it's less these days a measure of the number of operations as it is just an order of magnitude for the speed of the chip. The issue is that integer operations, like adding one plus one, 
um, and doing that four billion times as you might uh, for something. I don't know. Uh, that is a very simple operation and might very well take just one clock cycle. You might be able to do a billion of those in a second. The problem is that there are operations that take more than one clock cycle. And because of the way processors now try to aggressively optimize what they're trying to do for you, they're kind of looking ahead at what kind of instructions come next. Um, can they get ready for that instruction before it's actually time to run that instruction? They can actually do some operations kind of in parallel, which means that while yes, each operation takes one clock cycle, if you're doing two of them kind of sort of at the same time, the average might be less. So it's no longer really a true measure of exactly how fast the processor can perform individual operations, but it remains a measure of just how fast the processor is. Flops. A flop is actually an acronym, kind of, for floating point operation. Now, so far I've been talking about simple operations, integer operations, whole numbers between one and four billion, for example, would be one way of looking at them. Adding one and one, very simple, right? It's the kind of a thing that in binary is very, very, very simple to do. Floating point numbers are numbers with decimal fractions. So uh, 3.1 is a floating point number. 3.1. 1415926535589 is another very familiar floating point number. These are stored differently than integers. And the operations to actually manipulate floating point numbers are significantly more complex. And I mean more complex at a computational level, at the processor level. So floating point operations are important, an important measurement for a lot of different types of computer use because a lot of scientific work, a lot of, of all sorts of different things actually rely on floating point numbers rather than just doing everything in simple integers. So flops is a very important measurement for exactly how fast a computer might be in those kind of applications. The reason there's not a simple conversion is because the implementation of how a processor actually performs floating point operations varies from one processor to the next. One might be a very complicated and expensive processor able to perform floating point operations extremely quickly. One might be a less expensive processor, but one that might be use less power, be more appropriate for a laptop, whatever. It can still do floating point operations, but it can't do them as fast as the other one. So the underlying processor architecture makes a huge difference to exactly how fast floating point operations can happen on that specific hardware. So you'll never see a general conversion between gigahertz, the clock speed that the processor is running at, and the speed that a processor might be able to perform floating point operations. For one processor or one processor family, there might be a number, there might be a conversion, but it's not something that would hold true of all processors. And it's not something that, as it turns out, is particularly useful because you really are comparing apples and oranges in situations like that. You mentioned the petaflop in your question. That is nothing more than a quadrillion floating point operations per second, much like kilobytes and megabytes and terabytes and gigabytes and all those kind of other bytes. That same prefix, meaning a thousand or a million or a billion, also can get applied to flops or even hertz. So you end up with petaflops, meaning a quadrillion floating points operations per second, or gigahertz, meaning a billion clock cycles per second. If you're interested in something deeper on flops specifically, because it is very deep and very interesting technology, uh, the Wikipedia article on flops actually has a fair amount more information, and there's a link to that in the article that this video is based on. As I said, I hope this was helpful. 
Um, it hopefully clears up a little bit of the terminology. At least with that table, you can see what kinds of terms meet what kind of magnitude, and you can see what's coming next. For updates, for related links, for that table, for the original article on which this video is based, visit askleo.com slash 131697. I'm Leo Notenboom. This is askleo.com. Thanks for watching.